Guten Abend, ich danke sehr für diese Einladung. Ähm, wunderbar. Mein Vortrag wird allerdings trotzdem auf Englisch sein, das hat Olga ja gerade angesprochen. Ähm, und ich habe nicht viel Zeit, also fange ich gleich an. Translating music towards a pattern music. Almost exactly 17 years ago, and please earmark the number 17, numbers are important for composers. 17 years ago, I sat on a balcony overlooking a bay in a colonial city founded by the Portuguese. Loud traffic noise, horns and brakes, diesel engines and scooter screeches surrounded me. The room behind me was dark and silent and bare. The sea green hotel does not provide luxury, but I used to stay there for the view. To the left, on one of the two peninsulas that define the bay, I could see the high-rise five-star hotels of Nariman Point, and then a cluster of low buildings, first the National Center for the Performing Arts, and further along, the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research. On the hills of the peninsula to my right, lush greenery hid the governor's residence, the abodes of the extremely wealthy, many of them Arabians and Chinese, as well as two important spiritual places, the Parsi Towers of Silence and the Mumba Devi Banganga Tank, one of the oldest temple complexes of this city. My Indian family are fairly recent immigrants to this city. They arrived from the north in the 1930s, at the same time when the waterfront of the Sea Green Hotel was built. Yeah. <clears throat> with its modernist Art Deco style that really remind you of houses in Shanghai, Lisboa, or Kensington. Their language is Gujarati, one, from one of the first Islam-governed regions of this country that, however, has an even older history of trading with ancient Rome, Sumer, and Egypt. In the 17th century, then, these Gujaratis and Parsis, their Zoroastrian brothers, all experienced and urbane traders had helped the Portuguese establish this trading place in an area where the local population spoke Marathi. Later, much later, the English came and conquered and built railways into India. And these railways, in turn, carried many new languages to the city, Dravidian languages, Punjabi and Bengali. No one can walk to a street in the city without encountering at least two or three languages at every moment. And I envy Ranji Toskoti, who gave us the title of this panel, and whose poetry will inform my concert later this evening, um, for the linguistic diversity of his immediate urban environment. The very name of the city has undergone a curious sonic transformation, said what I want to talk about. When it was founded, it had been called Bombay, a Portuguese name meaning a good bay, a natural harbor. The British, anglicized Bahia to Bay, Bombay, when in the late, nine, late 20th century, the most blatant colonialist names were re-Indianized, Bombay was renamed Mumbai, the word that the Marathi-speaking majority of its population had been using for a long time as an adaptation of the Portuguese-English word to their own phonic system, their own tongue. Mumbai, in a strict sense, is a nonsense name in Marathi, but the serious act of renaming a city cannot be based on nonsense words. So the proponents of this name change constructed an etymology that led to the local deity Mumba Devi, whose linguistic and spiritual presence on this island was deemed to predate colonial settlement. Mumbai, the city of the Mumba goddess. So the process of creative misunderstanding in this sonic political exercise curiously echoes an ancient theory of aesthetic perception that still permeates most artistic expressions in India to this day, the theory, the theory of rasas and bhavas. Rasas are the inner emotional essence, the juice of a meaningful experience. Now the problem is, of course, that such an inner experience and meaning cannot be communicated directly between human beings. It needs to be communicated via body actions, touch, taste, posture, gesture, mimics, voice. These emotion and meaning signifiers are called bhavas. 
Kneeling before another person can be a bhava. A dance move is a bhava. A musical chord can be a bhava. A streak of color, a smile, a cry can be a bhava. An artist thus always produces nothing else but a collection of signifiers of bhavas. These bhavas, these cries, jumps, lines, words, growls, and stoops are then perceived and interpreted by the recipient. By a process of magical appropriation, they are then transformed back into a feeling, into a rasa. So this is the, this is the model, model of aesthetic perception, according to the Sanskrit tradition. But how does this magical transformation happen? This is where aesthetical languaging comes into play. I use this unusual term languaging instead of language because languaging orders artistic expressions much like languages order words, but language is a verbal convention adopted by many. Whereas languaging does not need more than one languager to exist. Indeed, many artists today have their own artistic language, their own private Esperanto. They language as a verb, even when they do not speak. Languaging is the act of making or performing a language, not, like most speaking, an act of communication. How does languaging work in the arts? Each artistic practice very soon develops a kind of dictionary in which certain bhavas are coupled to specific rasas. For example, the bhava of a melody sliding downwards could be named a sai and may be linked by aesthetic convention to the rasa of despair. Now when this sai bhava oh, appears in a musical piece, the conditioned, trained, and experienced listener knows that they should feel despair. Traditional artistic experience, then, according to the rasa bhava theory, is the quite magical, empathical experience of another human being in a world via the use of aesthetic conventions. Artistic traditions are based on such convention-based languaging. Some of you have been conditioned to feel the rasa of sadness when they hear a certain chord combination, a bhava, in a piece of Brahms. When an Indian classical music lover hears a certain pitch combination in a rag improvisation, a bhava again, they are accustomed to maybe feel the rasa of arousal. From this premise, artistic dictionaries of bhavas can develop a network of connection between all these bhavas, a grammar of aesthetic meanings. This grammar can then expand to become an artistic style, a genre, a tradition. Such communities of artistic expression can thus be distinguished from others mainly by their languaging system, their use of bhavas. Let us pursue this theory a little bit further. What can it tell us about two types of transaction between languaging systems? Firstly, the process which we usually call translation, and secondly, the kind of creative misunderstanding that transforms a good bay into the city of the Mumba Devi goddess. So a translator in our Rasa Bhava model does this. The translators look at the Rasa Bhava chain in one language environment, and then try in another languaging environment, the red one, to recreate a sequence, a bhava sequence that would recreate the rasa, the same rasa in another person. Um, that would be artistic translation. Um, maybe this gesture in India must be translated into this gesture in Germany to mean the same thing and to evoke the same emotion. Translation is the act of changing the bhavas to create a similar rasa. So you change the bhavas and create the, sim the same rasa in both environments. Creative misunderstandings operate differently. They take a bhava produced in one languaging environment and then implant it unchanged into the other. It's very likely that these bhavas in their new environment will produce a rasa that is very different from the original one. By this operation, a bhava can reveal new, a new perception of reality. I call such false translations, pata translations, as a reverence to Alfred Jarry's pata physics. Um, Jarry 
you many of you may know him from the play Roi Bu, coined the term pataphysics to postulate a form of thought about the world that goes beyond physics and metaphysics and examines the same phenomena as these. Or as he himself says, pataphysics symbolically attributes the properties of objects to their features. So the features become the properties. Um, its motto, the, the College of Pataphysics was very famous. It included members like Raymond Quenot, uh, Eugène Ionesco, Marcel Duchamp, and the Marx Brothers. And its motto was, Eadem mutata resurgo, I arise again the same and changed. A pata translation, therefore, is a translation that is not focused on reproducing the same meaning in another text, another context, but one that looks at the phenomenon from one context and considers the new meanings it can evoke in a new context. This can be a powerful approach in art making and it can open up new experiences, but translators naturally will view such um, pattern translations with suspicion. They have a name for them. It, they're called false friends. Words or phrases that seem to be the same in two different languages, but mean completely different things, like the object that you all have in your pocket, which the Germans call mein handy, while for the Anglophones it's just a handy thing to have around. We can sense the potential for lots of dangerous and stupid misunderstandings through false friends, but how does it work in other forms of artistic expression? How does it work in music? So 17 years ago, on my balcony in Sea Green Hotel on Mumbai's Marine Drive, or Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose Road, what was I doing there? I was compiling a musical dictionary. And I was trying to decide whether it would be a pata dictionary or a proper one. I had been inspired by Iveta Gerasimchuk's essay, Dictionary of Winds, an essay that proposes its arguments by way of wind metaphors that are arranged as a dictionary. I was writing a score for two ensembles, one consisting of European instruments and the other of Chinese instruments. Chinese classical instruments are different from Western instruments in many ways, and Chinese trained classical musicians language music differently than Western trained classical musicians. For each ensemble, I had written 10 short musical pieces, musical emulations of different types of winds. Wind and music are cousins because they appear from the same substance. They're all avatars of air. But wind is the nemesis of music because music needs still air to vibrate and wind needs moving air to be wind at all. So my composition were this love letters to the enemy music for the wind. I wanted now to translate the wind pieces that I had written for one ensemble into wind pieces that could be played by the other ensemble. But how should this translation happen? Should the new piece evoke the same feeling in the listener? So the feeling that, it, that the Western ensemble evokes in a Western listener should be the same feeling that the Chinese ensemble would evoke in the Chinese listener? Um, or should the same musical structure from one musical environment be carried over and evoke different feelings in the other culture? Should I translate or should I pata translate? It could go only one way. I'm not a Chinese trained musician and I have no sufficient body of knowledge and experience in Chinese musicking that would allow me to compose the true musical translation. So I had to pata translate. I had to keep the, the pitches and rhythms as identical as possible, as identical as the other instruments would permit, and then the same musical structure that I had composed for one ensemble became a totally different wind in the other. All this composing and compiling was only my early morning and late night activity because during the day, I worked with other sets of musicians, with Indian classical musicians, that's why I was in Bombay, and the musicians of the Ensemble Moderne. We worked on a completely different project of translation between Indian art music and urological art music. And in this situation, because there were musicians of both cultures in the room, we could actually try our hand at getting actual translations, trying to describe the feelings, trying to describe the emotions, and then seeing how that would play out in another musical style. So these musics would not have common bhavas. They would not sound the same but they should, in theory, evoke the same feeling in the listeners that are trained in listening to these musics. That was the time when every day I dreamt in three different musical languages. So in tonight's concert, which is happening soon, um, you will not hear this dictionary of wind, neither will you hear the piece with the Indian musicians called Rasa Lila, 
Both have been performed in Berlin in the dictionary in March 2002 at Matzmusik, and the Rasa Lila project was the focus of a big event here in Hakavi in 2003. But tonight you will hear 17 Miyagi haikus, another work of Pata translation, but this time one in which Pata translation is not just the only option of a stupid and ignorant composer, but has become the very basis of the compositional process. The score of the 17 Miyagi haikus is notated in common rest notation, but it uses this notation for a counterintuitive purpose. Notation always has been an incomplete tool, you never can write everything, and it relies a lot on oral tradition. The same sequence of notes in Mozart and Stravinsky would sound very differently. Um, so, over time, composers have become very um, uh, paranoid about this and have tried to fix more and more of their music in scores. Um, to minimize misunderstandings, or as we would now call it, pata interpretation. But the Miyagi haiku scores works exactly not like that. In it, the notated sequences are incomplete. The musicians may see what pitches they need to play, but not how, in which rhythm. Or they may see a rhythm, but no, no, do not know which pitches accompany it. And so each musician must bring this bhava, this incomplete bhava, into their own music. The musicians come from many different musical cultures, many different musical traditions, and each of them tries to translate it into their way of playing. So these are just the features of the music that now get transformed into the musician's inner world and in their, their, in, into their artistic practice. So the score of Miyagi haikus can only be interpreted in the process of pata translation. Um, so I'm not going to say much about the concert tonight because you, I hope you will all come. Um, but just a few words. This is a piece that I wrote in 2011 on one single day. Um, I was bowled over by uh, images from the tsunami that hit Japan in 2011 and I wanted to write something. I wrote these 17 Miyagi haikus which will tonight be performed by 17 musicians. And many musicians over the last eight years have performed these. There's a CD out now that you can buy at a store. And you could hear original versions of these, music, of these compositions or the sort of ensembles have created versions and you could hear them yesterday in the concert. And then we started over last night and this whole day to bring three ensembles and another one that has never played this piece into one big ensemble and within one day create a version, a new version, a new Pata translation of this score. And you will hear another little twist. I had recorded these or these, these Miyagi haikus had been recorded by musicians as a translation of a haiku. A haiku is a literary form. So I gave the recordings to poets and asked them to listen to the music, only listen to the music, not read the score, listen to the bhava of the music and create poetry out of the music. And they did that. I'm very happy to uh, Yang Lian, Ranjit Haskote, Monica Rink, Yoko Tavada, Christian Phillips, and Lance Olson, that they not only responded to my request, but for the manner in which they responded with truly pataphysical sensibility and creative irreverence. In one of the poems, Yoko Tavada's cycle, Don't Come Too Close, I'm Radiating, she paraphrases, or pataphrases, the motto of the Collège de Fata Physique, I arise the same and changed, in a new way, to travel airily without uranium's weight, to fleetingly return, claiming no heritage. Thank you. <laughs> 